Howdy everyone! On today's Jolly Lark, I'm going to be diving into the new Conquest Last Argument of Kings Siege Breaker Behemoth. Like the Tontor dinosaur I did in a previous video, this is a massive model. So I'm going to try to get it lined up with the grid here. I had to, it's so big I had to clear the decks and I couldn't use my normal you know, palette paper for it. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine inches about tall and just about as wide as it is tall. This is a big model. And what I've done to prep this for speed painting is primed it with black primers, regular spray on black primer, sprayed the whole thing purple, and then as you can see here, sprayed it gray, kind of a light gray from above. I used the Vallejo uh, light gray. I just used a regular purple. I think I used Vallejo game color purple um, all over a black primer. So they were ending up with a model that's gray on top purple underneath with a little bit of black in the deepest cracks and crevices. So to get things started, I'm grabbing a translucent red paint, in this case Vallejo's Express Colors Velvet Red, but uh, the contrast color Flesh Terror's Red is also a great choice, and I'll be using that some later in the video too. It's a little bit darker, deeper, and what I'm doing here is painting this red on to the kind of muscly biological kind of fleshy looking areas and being kind of messy about it and my idea here is that I want the muscly bits of the model to be red and look like muscles but I also kind of want some of that biological gloop to spill out and seep uh, it's a big model spill out and kind of seep over onto the armor plates and you could do that by painting the red on and then feathering it out with a damp brush but on a big model, you can also just spray the entire model with water so that the whole thing is a little bit wet. And then as you're painting the red onto the red bits, it'll naturally kind of seep out onto the rest of the model. It'll make it very easy to feather the red out onto some of the, the body plates. You can see here I'm putting on some pure red onto the musculature, and it'll kind of seep out into the bony areas a little bit because the bony areas are damp and make it pretty easy to kind of blend the two colors together. And this is just a getting started. We're gonna add some, some shades and some highlights. Uh, and so what you can do is you know put the, put the pure red paint onto the musculature, but then once most of the paint's off the brush, kind of wipe the red brush onto the damp armor plates to get some of that, some of that spillage, some of that seepage that I'm going for. So let's zoom in and take a little bit closer look. So this is a, a big, pretty fat brush full of, you know, pure red paint, red, the red kind of contrast style paint. I'm gonna paint that all over the musculature like so. And, and a little bit of water um, that's on the model from that is, is fine. It just helps the, the highlights, the raised areas look a little bit lighter. So no problem there. And then once you've kind of painted the muscly area that you want, you can wipe off some of the red or most of the red off your brush then just swipe that kind of empty brush onto the part of the model that's damp from the, the water mister. And you'll then get that effect where a little bit of those bodily fluids are seeping out onto the armor. You know, you don't have this writhing bio horror serpent monster slithering around the battlefield without it getting a little messy with its own fluids, which is like kind of gross and not exactly the type of model I normally paint, but it is also pretty fun to do something different for a change. Um, this, I'm doing this actually thanks to Parabellum. They sent me this model to paint for the channel, which is so thank you for that. I appreciate it. It really was fun to, to paint something different here. So start to finish, this model, as you saw it briefly at the beginning of the video, took about two hours to paint. Um, that's not including some dry times, which is inevitable when you're dealing with a, a big model and you're painting with a lot of wet washes. Um, but about two hours of active time, I shot about two hours of video to record record the whole process. Um, obviously I'm going to cut that down to a much shorter video, but if you have any questions, you can always ask them down in the comments below. I'm always happy to answer questions. So if you notice that the parts of your model are starting to dry out a little bit, you can just hit it with another little blast of water and that'll be, that'll be just fine. So I'm not going to show every single minute of the painting process, obviously. Um, that make for a too long video. That's something I've had a couple of people ask about um, posting the full painting, the full painting footage. On a, on a Patreon or something like that. I don't know. That's not something I've really given a lot of thought to, but if it's something you'd be interested in, let me know. 
Um, so I'm just going to work my way around the model, doing the same technique, pure red on all the fleshy bits, and then feathering that red out kind of all over, but just a little bit on all the bone plates, uh, kind of like so. So going for strong red colors on the muscles, hint a little bit of pinkish reddishness on the bone plates for now. So when you're done with this stage, this model kind of looks like a big old mess. Um, it kind of looks like it's covered in red right now, um, but you actually are seeing a lot more of that gray purple undercoat on the armor plating areas than the thick red coat that you've got on the, the musculature. So at the end of this phase, looking for something about like this. Um, obviously this is, this is get like, like the title says, get get messy, go fast. This is this is a loose process. There's no mistakes at this point. Uh, well, there's never any mistakes. You can always fix a mistake. But I'm going for something that is red muscles, red tinged armor plates, like so. Now, once that's had a minute to dry and all that red is dry on the model, it can help to have a little fan blowing or a ceiling fan or something to get that dried out faster. I don't like you to use a blow dryer on this because it's thick enough puddles that you're sometimes a blow dryer when it's pushing the paint around. But once all the reds dry, I'm gonna grab some Pro Acryl Red Gray, which is kind of on the light side for a first dry brush, but we're gonna add some shadows later with some other washes. And I'm doing a very heavy dry brush here all over the model on the armor plates. Don't worry at all if you get a little bit of this gray color onto some of the, the muscle bits, that, that's fine. It'll get covered up in a future step, but I'm, I'm really concentrating on all the armor plates. The little piece of black plastic down below I'm using as a dry brush palette. Um, all that is is a couple of millimeters that I 3D printed, just a, a very short box that I 3D printed. Um, and then the natural lines that come on a 3D print actually make for a pretty good dry brush palette. So if you've got a 3D printer, or you know somebody who does, that can be a, a really nice do-it-yourself dry brush palette to just print a, a box, just print a very flat, short box that's whatever size you want, and it, it makes a nice dry brush palette. You can kind of see when the texture of the paint on the brush is correct, when you're only picking up the lines on that piece of plastic. Let's zoom way in here. You can kind of see how this is going on one of the claws. So you can see it's really got kind of gray all over, but you're still seeing some of the hints of the the red that you put on on the previous step in you know in the kind of cracks and crevices of the gray one of the nice things about dry brushing is you don't have to wait for the paint to dry it's basically already dry by the time you're done with the step so once i've got all the uh, the red gray dry brushed on i'm going to switch over to the pro acryl bone which is a much lighter color and again just kind of go all over the armor plates this time the gray really wasn't all over. This time I am going to start creating some lighting on the model by focusing this dry brush on the raised parts of the model. The parts of the model where light was hit, if you imagine a light shining on it. So we're going to do the lighter bone color on all the parts of the model that you can easily see. So any parts of the model that are facing the ground, any parts of the model that are tucked in kind of tightly with other parts of the model, like inside of the, the curl of its tail, we're not going to try to get in there with this bone color. We're going to leave that at the, at the gray, and those are going to get shadowed later. So just kind of keep going around the model. Any, any prominent pieces, any upward-facing surfaces, you know, so that the whole back, the tops of the claws, all that good stuff, all that gets a nice solid coat. Uh, not a solid coat, a, a heavy dry brush of that bone color. I mean, you still want the, the paint to be sparse enough on the brush, that you're not putting a, a solid opaque, opaque coat on, you still want to be able to see a little bit of that red that you put on, a little bit of the purple undercoat in the cracks and crevices. So time skipping forward here, as we're finishing up with the layer of the bone dry brush, we're starting to get something like this. I mean, don't worry at all if you hit some of the muscles with the bone, that's totally fine, but you're ending up with something that looks kind of like this. The, we're starting, the bone plates are starting to come together and we're going to further highlight those by adding another dry brush layer of ivory to really make the, the bone plates look bony and rocky and hard. You can kind of think of the different dry brushing layers as being a little bit like the circles of a bullseye, where the first dry brush layer is big, you're covering the whole model, and then each time you add a lighter color, 
you're bringing that color in a little bit, like the circles of a bullseye of a target, until eventually the brightest color you're dry brushing on is covering the least amount of the model, but kind of at the focal points, just like you're, you're hitting that bullseye with the brightest area. So it's good to keep in mind while you're dry brushing what the brightest areas are gonna be. On this model, it's gonna be those spikes behind its head, it's gonna be the tops of the claws, it's gonna be the front of the tail, it's gonna be the back, the upper back of the model. Those are eventually gonna be the, the bullseyes, those are gonna be the smallest parts of the dry brushing. The areas that have the least amount of paint, so you can keep that in mind now and kind of be focusing in on that area with each successive layer of color. So as we're finishing up the layer of bone, which is the, if you're keeping score, the third color that we're dry brushing on, the, the shape of the model is really starting to, to pop a little bit more. The upper facing surfaces that you can see here and the models facing the camera are nice and bright. But then when you look at the model more from the side, the side colors get darker. It, you know, it kind of gets darker as it goes on, as it goes down. As the, as the light isn't hitting it. The inside of the, the coil of its tail is a little bit darker than the, the brightest parts of the model. But to really make the armor plates look kind of thick and stony, you want to grab some pure white. I really recommend Pro Acryl's Bold Titanium White for this. It's one of the best white paints I've ever used. And this is about as light a dry brush as you can manage. Maybe not quite that light, but you're just really looking to hit the edges of things. You're not painting anything solidly white. It's just the raised little cracks, the cre crevices, not in the crevices, just kind of the cracks and the bumps and the edges are getting a little bit of white to, to make it pop. Now something to remember when you're doing a white dry brush is that even the very, very best white paints still don't cover that well. You know, if you imagine painting you know, an opaque solid layer of white, over a darker background, it takes a few coats of white to really cover it and make a surface look white. And the same thing is true of dry brushing. And this is this is true of lots of lighter colors, but it's particularly true of white. So don't think of it as yourself as done until you're happy with how bright the white dry brush is. It may take kind of a few passes around the model with dry brushing on white before those the most raised kind of edges and bumps on the model really pop out. I think on this model, I ended up kind of, probably kind of doing about three passes of white dry brushing, dry brushing the same area as white a few times so that each time I went over, it lightened up, it brightened up the white just a little bit because that second layer is going on top of the first and then the third layer of white dry brush that you're putting on has two layers of white underneath it to really make it pop. So let's jump forward to here. The white is done. We're going to start darkening up the muscles again. Uh, and you can see those white bone plates are really looking bony now with a few layers of white on it. So the muscles have gotten gotten hit with a lot of white over the and, and bone and lighter colors over the course of dry brushing, which is fine and intended. So now I'm going to go a little slower, a little more carefully. I'm not trying to, to bleed the red paint all over the place. A little bit smaller brush. I'm going to grab some Citadel Flesh Terrors Red, which is a very nice organic shade of red, and go in a little bit more carefully and repaint all the muscle, muscly areas like so with Flesh Terrors Red. Now this looks great when it first goes on because it's nice and like wet and glistening. But then it dries to a much more matte, flat finish. But that's okay. At the end, we can restore some of that glisten with some gloss varnish. In addition to the obvious muscly areas, I'm also going to take with a, the thinner brush a little bit of watered down Flesh Terrors Red and paint some red into some of the cracks in the armor to make it look like you're seeing through the cracks of the armor into kind of a fleshy area underneath. So even some of these like vent slots and stuff on the back. It's a nice place to put a little little hint of red. And you know, don't be afraid to use your fingers. Like I said, go fast, get messy. Um, if you just get a little bit of red on the raised armor edges, just wipe it off and it'll blend right in with those reds that we, that red wash we did in the very first step. I actually like that effect well enough that I mixed up a batch of very watery red that you can see on the palette down below and added some of that very watery red just kind of in random patchiness um, as a big organic monster, you know, that's not necessarily going to be perfect. So not all over, 
but just kind of adding some random little blobs and bits of that very, very watered down red all over the armored carapace. Not all over, little bits of it all over. So with that done, we've got something that looks kind of like this. Already looking pretty cool. You could probably paint the helmet there, paint the base, and call this game ready. But to my eye, it's, it's a little monochromatic, a little monotone all over, and still could use a little bit darkening up, um, which is to say just kind of darkening the, the shadowed areas, darkening the hidden areas, darkening some of the deepest uh, kind of crevices and pits on the model. So we're gonna do that by grabbing one of my very favorite colors, the Citadel Drakenhof Nightshade. It's a, a very, very dark blue, and it's one of their shade colors, so it's very transparent and really runs into the recessed areas of the model. And I feel like it's just with magic shadows in a bottle. I really like how it looks. And I like taking a model, kind of starting from the mid-tones, going light, just like we did with the armor. The armor never really was that dark. It was a, a medium purple and gray. We dry brushed lighter from there. And with this Drakenhof Nightshade, what it's going to allow us to do is just paint in the shadows and darken up any areas of the model that kind of are on the lower facings. Anything that's kind of pointed to the ground is going to get a coat of the Drakenhof Nightshade. So essentially you're, you're painting shadows onto the model. I think this is a fun way to do it. I think it's a nice way to practice placing the shadows. And it, I think it's a little faster and easier because you don't necessarily have to decide where the shadows are going to be to start with, especially for newer painters. Um, so you can just kind of get in there um, in any of the, the deep recesses of the model, like inside the snake's curve, underneath the snake's tail, just like we did there. And it's kind of smear it around. It doesn't, straight out of the pot, it doesn't create those kind of water stains that badly. So don't be afraid to kind of blob it on in the deepest parts and then just use your brush to kind of, especially on a big model like this, just kind of use your brush to kind of pull it out and can kind of feather it out with a damp brush like so, so that it's lightening up as it comes up from the shadows. This is such a universally useful shadow color. It really works on almost every color. So you can come in and kind of paint the undersides of the arms, the armpits, and get into the, the cracks and the crevices on the lower parts of the muscles too. And this the nightshade works well on the pale bone, and it also works well on the red muscles. And this is sometimes a little bit hard to show in a video because it's really accentuating the, the lower facing parts of the model, but it makes a big difference into boosting the contrast on the model, making the darks a little darker while leaving the lights alone. Which is an important point to remember that this isn't an all over gnome oil wash. You're just putting on the nightshade where shadows would fall on the model. If you put it all over, you haven't increased the contrast very much. You've just made the whole model darker. It's only by making some parts of the model darker while leaving some of the parts alone that you're kind of increasing the contrast. So you can see a good example on the shell here, this lower part of the shell, I'm gonna put a little bit of the shadows on, and that makes then it look a little bit darker compared to the raised part of the shell that's closer to the top of the model. Once you're happy with your shadows, let that dry, and you'll end up your, with something like this where you've got some darker areas in the muscles, some darker areas of the shell, and now we're just gonna make the brightest area of those muscles pop just a little bit by grabbing some pure bright red. This is the proacryl red and red red, uh, I think we call pyrrole red. Um, and we're just going to dry brush with a much smaller brush, dry brush a little bit of this bright red onto some of the raised areas of the muscle that didn't get so much of the uh, Dragonhawk Nightshade. It just makes these look a little more vibrant and pop a little bit more. When painting red, I'll often leave pure red as kind of the, the brightest color. They start to get pink pretty fast. And so I often tend to shadow red down rather than highlighting it up and then leave a bright red as the brightest, lightest highlight. So with that, we're pretty close to done with the main body of the beast. And we're gonna go into some of the detailing here. My plan is to use some iridescent colors for the mask and to prepare the mask for that, I'm gonna give it an all over coat of black and then once the black is dry, put on a coat of clear gloss varnish. The iridescent colors work better over a gloss varnish than they do over a matte varnish. 
Uh, so if you have a bottle of paint on gloss varnish, it's good to put some of that on before using any iridescence. To prepare the body eyeballs, which is, I don't know if that's a phrase I've ever said before, but to prepare the body eyeballs for painting later, I'm going to go back and grab a little bit more of ivory and just put an opaque coat of ivory on all the eyeballs. This might take a couple of coats because it's going light over a darker color. Um, I'm trying to be careful not to get any of the ivory outside the eyeball, but if you leave a little bit of red at the edges, that's fine. In the same vein, I'm going to put a little bit of kind of a pinky fleshy color on all of the hands that are pulling the, the flesh apart to reveal the eyeballs. Again, just kind of getting some of the, some of that pink color on the, the hands, but I'm not being too not being too neat about it. Once that's dry, I'm going to mix up some more of the Flesh Terror's Red. Mixed about four parts water, one part contrast to make a thin red wash. I'm going to put that all over the hands and then also wash that onto the eyeballs too to kind of blend those new colors into the musculature around it. When you get to doing the, the eyeballs, I'm going to put a little bit of red all over the eye but I don't want it to be quite that red, so then I'm gonna rinse my brush off in water, and then just with a damp brush, kind of pull the red away from the middle of the eye, so that the red fades from a, a still a little bit of a red tinge in the middle, but not quite as dark as it is all over, and kind of fades from an ivory in the middle out to red on the outsides of the eyeball. So to paint the eyes, I'm gonna grab two colors, a dark and a light, and then mix up a color that's kind of in between the two, in this case, I'm using the Pro Acryl Dark Jade and Bright Jade, but you could pick any two colors that, that float your boat. I thought this sort of bluish green would both look good against the red, kind of pop out from the red, and also complement the, like the Bright Jade, looks good with some of the purple undertones. So all I'm going to do here is paint a dark circle in the middle of each eye, and my technique for painting circles tends to be to kind of just make, start in the center, and it, it's always gonna be imperfect, but you just kind of start in the center and then move outwards and with each brush stroke, try to make it look a little more circular. So you're kind of pulling out the sides of the circle where it looks flat, and you just kind of keep going at that until it looks circular. That's much easier than trying to just paint a perfect circle. It's also the case that it lets you kind of calibrate the size of the colored part of the eye, the iris, that if you try to paint the outside edge of the circle first and realize that it's too big, you've just painted a dark color over a light color, that's, that's hard to fix. So starting small and going bigger, I just think it's a little faster, a little less likely to result in a mistake that you need to fix later. On track with your circles, I'm just gonna grab a little bit of the medium color I just kind of paint straight lines in kind of a starburst pattern from one edge of the circle to the other. And then the black pupil of the eye will go on top of these. This is just helping to create some of those natural kind of starburst striations that eyeballs have. And when you do this step, it kind of looks bad. It just looks like you're painting a little, you know, cartoony star. Um, but it'll look good once there's a black pupil popped into the middle of the eye. And once you're done with that, you can then go back in with the lighter color and add a few more lines that are kind of coming from the outside in, in the brighter jade. And then it's kind of, until there's just some variation, there's not a right or wrong way to do it. You're just looking for some kind of variation in colored lines coming, you know, from out to in. If you overdo it on the light stuff, you can, like I did on this eye, you can grab a little bit of the dark color and draw a couple little dark lines in. You're just kind of looking for a little bit of interesting variation like that. For the pupils, I'm going to use one of the dotting tool that I talked about in my last video. You can go check that out if you want to see those in a little bit more detail. But it's just a great way to put a very precise, single little tiny black dot in the middle of each eye. Much easier than painting it. To finish off the helmet, I'm going to grab some Turbo Dork Molten Mantle. This is a color shifting, kind of iridescent, purpley paint that I think will look good with the, the purple undertones on the bone. And this works best when it's airbrushed on. But you can paint it on. Um, but anyway, for this little small area, it's definitely easier to, to brush it on than to airbrush it. But be warned that when it takes a few coats, so this is over gloss black. I put on a coat of gloss varnish that I didn't show because who cares about that? Um, but I did gloss varnish. I just painted on some gloss. And then this is going to take probably five or six coats of this to get the sort of iridescent look that I'm going for. 
So just paint on a thin layer. You don't want it to be clumpy. Paint on a thin layer, let it dry. Paint on another layer, let it dry. Paint on another layer, let it dry until you've got the kind of iridescent sheen that you're happy with. So finally, after uh, six coats, no big deal, but it just, it just takes a few. Kind of got the sort of shine that I'm looking for on the faceplate. All right, so we're going back to the gloss varnish, but here's the gloss varnish step that you do care about and that's pretty fun to do. And this is what I mentioned at the very beginning of the video, is bringing back some of that biological, organic, wet shininess to the muscly areas. So in the middle of my palette there, it's another product I mentioned on my, my favorite products of 2023 video that I released earlier this week. And uh, I'm just I have a big puddle of gloss varnish. This is the Vallejo Mecca gloss varnish. And I'm just gonna paint some of this onto all of the red areas. Uh, this is gonna give it just a nice kind of glossy wet shine and will provide some natural highlights in whatever environment you're playing it in and make the, the muscly area look appropriately kind of wet and bloody and you know kind of leaning into the, the bio horror aspect of this. I am trying reasonably hard here to not get it on any of the bony plates because the other thing the gloss varnish is gonna do here is give you a nice visual contrast between the wet, muscly parts of the miniature and the dry, bony parts of the miniature. So the more you can keep it off of the armor plates, the more contrast that you'll get. So as a final step, this is something I've wanted to try for a little while and I haven't done before, is creating some kind of glistening slime trails between some of the body parts using Uhu glue. This is a clear glue that's very sticky. And just grabbing a little bit of it on the Q-tip, you can kind of drag strands of it from one part of the model to the other. And it's, it takes a minute to dry. Um, and as I'm learning here, because this is the first time I've done it, it works almost a little bit like a hot glue gun where it kind of leaves some little strands when you pull away from the model. I'll just go and clean those up later with a, a pair of tweezers. So just kind of do this wherever you want, kind of an alien, xenomorphy sort of gloop that's kind of attaching the biological parts of the models kind of to each other, kind of dragging it from muscle to muscle. And kind of, I'm trying to stay away from the bony parts of the model. Notice I'm using a little yogurt lid as a palette here because I didn't want to get the glue on the silicone pal palette. Something else I learned, you can see what's happening on the palette there is that the glue is actually dissolving the dried paint that I had on the palette previously. So just to avoid that, I would just use a clean palette, put the glue, put the clear glue on top of an area of the palette that doesn't have paint on it. And you'll be, you know, because you don't necessarily want to mix that paint in with the glue if you want it to, to remain clear. The other thing I realized doing this is that the glue works best when it's fresh out of the bottle. So if I was doing this again, I would serve myself up a little bit less each time and use the, I think the fresher glue right out of the tube works better to create thicker strands of the stuff. But overall, I was pretty happy with how this turned out. I think I probably am not going to be doing a full Spires army anytime soon. I've got my uh, City States and Wadroon to finish up first. Um, so I'm okay if this model is a little bit more delicate and kind of sits in the display case. Um, and if you know, some of these little strands broke in gameplay down the road, no big deal. So once the, the glue's all dry, I'm going to kind of go in with a little bit of the gloss varnish and dab a little bit of gloss varnish onto some of the strands to thicken them up a little bit and to put some little clear droplets kind of mid strand to make it look a little bit extra gloopy. And that's it, that was my final step. I cleaned up some of those little tiny strands with a, an old brush, base it up however you'd like to match the rest of your army and you've got a behemoth of a model ready to hit the table. Like I said, this is about two hours of painting time start to finish, so really not a hard job to do after dinner some evening. So hopefully this was useful. Hopefully it was helpful. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. It really does help when you uh, subscribe to the channel, like the video, add a comment. So thanks for that, and I will see you next time for another Jolly Lark.